I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is part five of the Magician Bhadra Sutra. Um, so it being part five, I'm not going to go too much over the plot and the story. You know the story about this magician Bhadra who tried to fool the Buddha <laughs> only to have him wind up being fooled in a way. Um, but I actually, I digress. Again, I'm not going to go over the whole plot. Uh, please refer to part one through four. Uh, if you want to kind of find out how we got here in that way. Tonight is very much totally a continuation of last Sunday. Um, in, in other words, we reached a point in the sutra where the magician Bhadra had sort of uh, seen the light, had come kind of uh, changed his, his deceptive ways, and he proceeded to recite in verse a very long poem in which he, you know, kind of, in, I guess in a sense, apologizes, if you will, uh, for trying to deceive the Buddha. Uh, he sees the error of his ways. And then he kind of asks, in this beautiful uh, poem, he asks the Buddha this series of questions you know, how can one be grateful and return favors? How can one always be a permanent friend to all sentient beings? Uh, how can one achieve an enlightened mind? How can one realize uh, the truth of all dharmas? So he goes through this long poem asking the Buddha, the Tathagata, these series of questions. And in particular, I just want to remind you of one of the questions that Bhadra has asked. And, and you, in order to understand the question, you need to remember, at this point in the sutra, the Buddha has manifested himself in many places at once, in many different palaces, in many different arenas. The Magician Bhadra sees all of these different Buddhas in all of these different places, doing all of these different things. Interestingly, he, he also sees himself before all of those different Buddhas in all of those different situations. So that's interesting. But one of sort of the main questions that Bhadra asks is, I want to make offerings to the real Buddha. So tell me which one is the real Buddha so that I can make offerings to the Tathagata, to the thus come one. And it's so in response to that, in response to Bhadra's many questions, including which one of you is the real Buddha, that then the Buddha begins to reply. And I read the beginning of the Buddha's reply last time, but I'm gonna kind of start over tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna basically read the Buddha's poem, the Buddha's response in its entirety. That's the plan for tonight. If, if you asked me like my scholarly opinion about this sutra, I would suggest that this poem that I'm about to read tonight is the heart of the sutra. And there's a, many ways in which everything else has just been window dressing for this poem. Uh, even the story, even the pretense under which we got here and all of the hoopla around the great magic uh, debate or the great magical competition, it's all gonna be just to get us to this poem. And again, I did start to read it last time, but I wanna start over I only read a few stanzas, so it's, it's not that big of a deal, but it's also that, well, the whole poem has a certain arc to it. It, it has ideas, and so I wanna just refresh our memory about where those ideas started. Um, also, by the way, I wanna re remind everyone that 
the sutra that we're reading is part of this collection of sutras called the Maharatnakuta Sutra, the great pile of jewels. Um, some of, not all of the pile of jewels, but some of the jewels are translated in this, a treasury of Mahayana sutras, of which we read from most Sunday nights here in the Dharma doors. However, this particular sutra has a, an alternate translation online. Uh, this is at uh, lapislazulitext.com. Uh, we've had the link up before, it's floating around, uh, and I'm sure you could find it. And for the most part, I've been reading from this translation because I, it is, um, it's much more accurate to the original source material, which happens to be a Chinese version of this sutra. We don't have a Sanskrit version of the sutra, so we're relying on a uh, medieval, Sans or medieval Chinese translation. This English translation is much more accurate to the Chinese, but you know, this is the problem with translation, especially translating poetry. It's so tricky because, you know, you can be really, you know, true to the original text, but not capture the, the sound of it or the flow of it or anything like that. Or you can try to capture the cadence and the flow, but at the expense of the exact meaning, the exact words. And so, for some of these poems, I've actually moved back to the, uh, this version of the sutra because the translators of this version very much kept a very good poetic style. Mm, you know, even though they're taking some liberties here and there, understandably so. Um, but tonight, actually, uh, since last week, I've taken some time and I did a... Uh, my own fresh translation of this, mainly because I was, I kept coming up into, you know, uh, some problem areas in both versions. And I, I knew I was basically going to start jumping back and forth between the two, and then eventually abandoning them both altogether. And so I'm going to just be reading from uh, a version that I've been working on this week. Um, it is certainly like all translations informed by the existent translations. So I'm not, uh, you know, pretending I didn't look at the other translations. So you'll notice a lot of crossover. Um, but in other words, if you have either of both of the other translations, you can read along, but I don't want you to be confused about where I'm getting these words from. And again, for the most part tonight, I'm going to just do a reading of this poem and we're going to go through it. It's very, um, uh, it's very interesting to say the least. Um, and even before we, yeah, actually, I think we can dive in. I'll probably stop before too long. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is, so this is the, the Buddha's reply to the magician Bhadra's series of questions. Um, and also just the, the, Buddha, um, the Buddha's response to Bhadra in general, the response to this whole uh, magical competition. And so the Buddha starts off with the theme of the sutra, okay? He starts off by saying, if one, if one knows that all dharmas, all things, all phenomena, if one knows that all dharmas are the same as illusions, this person will then be able to manifest hundreds of billions of Buddha bodies, abide in myriads of lands, and deliver all sentient beings. Just like the magician Bhadra manifests various, various things of form out of formlessness. These things that do not arise and do not cease are without abiding and without going and without coming. The world's honored ones, transformation bodies, as well as this assembly of bhikshus are also without arising, without ceasing. 
nor do they attain nirvana. These are all the inconceivable spiritual transformations of the Tathagata. Just like manifestations of elephants, horses, and soldiers by a magician, confusing and perplexing sentient beings who erroneously see them as real, like these elephants, horses, and soldiers that are without any inherent nature, without any arising, all Buddhas are without physical characteristics, without going and without arriving or without coming. So that's a, um, a retranslation of what we read last week. That's a restatement of the kind of the theme of this sutra that all dharmas, all phenomena, all things, anything and everything you could possibly think of or imagine, that all dharmas are like illusions. That's sort of the grand teaching of the, the sutra in that way. And then in the opening to this poem, the Buddha references this magician creating these elephants and horses and soldiers. And that's where we ended last week, where I read from a very old Pali Sutta from the old collection of connected discourses of the Buddha from the Samyutta Nikaya. I read that tiny part of that tiny little, the Sutra on the foam, the Fena Sutta in which the Buddha talks about a magician at a crossroads creating all of these, um, what look like elephants, what look like horses, what look like soldiers, but they're all illusory. They're not actually soldiers. They're not actually elephants. They're not actually horses, but they're made to look like that. They have the appearance of those things. And in that very, very old, Pali Sutta, the Buddha says, all those things have no inherent nature. And essentially what he says in the sutra is that all dharmas are the same way. So it, there's an interesting way in which, you know, this, su this sutra is sort of quoting and referencing that very old sutta. And that's what kind of we've read so far. Um, yeah, I'm going to return probably at some point to one of the lines of that thing, that part I just read, but now let's get into the new part. So this is the new part. And again, I'm going to try to avoid bouncing between all these different translations. I kind of want to try to keep the clarity of these ideas tonight and not confuse you in that way. So let's just go line by line, see how it goes. So after that, after stating that all Buddhas are without physical characteristics, without rupa lakshana is the term, and that they are, all Buddhas are without coming or going. They neither arise nor cease, right? The Buddha goes on to say, those who abide in the view of a self erroneously give rise to ideas of the Buddha. Or those who abide in the view of the self give rise to erroneous ideas. <laughs> the Chinese is a little ambiguous. It can kind of cut either way. But the idea is, is that those who abide in the view of a self give rise to erroneous ideas about the Buddha. It should not be by way of physical characteristics, by caste, by birth, or by birthplace, or even by a supreme Brahma voice. None of that should be used to observe the Tathagata nor should the Tathagata be observed even by the mind or consciousness, which cannot discriminate the Buddha. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to pause and just kind of break down the ideas of that first part so I can set the theme for tonight very clearly, and then we'll go on to read more about what is to come. So the main thing going on here in this part I just read is this idea of those who abide in the view of a self. And there's a number of things about to happen tonight in this poem, a number of ideas. And I want to kind of reference everybody to our good old Diamond Sutra, otherwise known as the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. Tonight's, the poem tonight is definitely, in fact, this sutra is a grand, beautiful, magical presentation of the ideas that are found in this essential Mahayana Sutra. So the Vajrapanya Paramita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, is very much the original source of a lot of these ideas. In particular, in particular, chapter five of the Vajra Sutra, the, the Diamond Sutra, Chapter five is a very short chapter of that sutra, and I can almost just say it right now, which is that the Buddha asks this monk, he asks Subhuti, hey Subhuti, what do you think? Can you see a Buddha, can you see the Tathagata using physical characteristics? And the answer is no, the Buddha cannot, the Tathagata, the Buddha cannot be seen by physical characteristics. Chapter five actually famously says, anywhere there are characteristics, there is delusion. And in a way, by not relying upon physical characteristics, that's how one sees the Buddha or sees the Tathagata in that sense. So that's a major theme of the Vajra Sutra that's about to get um, elaborated on in, the, in this sutra. There's also a very important part of the Vajrapanya Paramita Sutra, which is about this idea of a view of a self, right? And of course, if you're a, a student of Dharma, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know Buddhism is very much about this idea of a self. And in particular, no self, as it's called, anatta or anatman this idea of there not being a self in that way. And so the poem, the part of the poem that I just read, which is to say those who abide in the view of a self give rise to erroneous ideas about the Buddha, right? And then it goes on to say that if, if you want to observe the Buddha, if you want to observe a Tathagata, it should not be by way of physical characteristics caste, birth, or birthplace. It shouldn't even be if they speak with the, the supreme voice of Brahma, of God. So let's break that down because that's actually a really powerful statement. You know, it's very tempting, of course, um, to overlook this, to just sort of like move right past this. And I want to kind of make clear what's being spoken about here with this idea of, of seeing or observing a Buddha, a Tathagata, a thus come one, observing them based on physical characteristics. So the idea is, you know, is the Buddha an Indian guy? Like that's the idea. You know, last time I looked up in on Wikipedia, the Buddha is a guy from India, right? And actually, if you read the Wikipedia article, a certain caste, he was a Kshatriya, right? So he was a guy from India, this particular caste, born of King, you know, Sudhadana or, you know, and Maya, right? So the idea is, is that if you're, if you're thinking that the Buddha was a guy from India from 2,500 years ago, yeah, that's not the Buddha. That's not the Tathagata. According to this sutra, according to the Mahayana tradition, to kind of box the Buddha into the category of 
Well, that was a lot of categories. That was a lot of physical characteristics, right? Their nas his nationality, his gender, his caste, all of these things. So this is suggesting that the Buddha sh can't be seen and should not be seen by in that way. And what this particular, the little part I just read, what it suggests is, is that the root of that idea is this idea of the view of a self, right? And so that's going to be kind of, I'm going to, I kind of chose that idea to dive into tonight to kind of get us, to get us going so we can read the rest of this, but we kind of get our, got to get our heads in the right place, right? And, you know, there's a number of different ways to discuss the idea of no self, right? I mean, it's such an essential part of Buddhism. It is sort of one of, if not the essential teaching that goes all the way back to like the first sutta, all the way to this sutta, sutra. And, you know, it's a complicated idea. And again, there's a, a bunch of different ways I as a teacher could try to break it down for you, right? One classic example of the self, of course, is this idea of the socially constructed self. This idea of my idea of myself is going to be predicated on a bunch, a bunch of um, social situations, if you will. Things like my birthplace, my birth family, my last name, my occupation, what gender I identify with, all of these different things that go to construct the sense of who I, Michael, think Michael is, right? Michael is this, you know, teacher, right? Uh, a male teacher. Maybe I, I'm tall, right? Let's bring that one in from a few weeks ago. So tall male teacher person, right? But as I often say, if there were nobody listening, I wouldn't be a teacher. I'd be a lunatic sitting here talking to myself. So there's a way in which students, teacher are, you know, dependently originated in that way. Of course, there's a way in which we've talked about how if I'm considered tall, that's relative to short, male, relative to female, all of these different things that are actually kind of social constructions. But I may, of course, rely upon those social constructions for my sense of self. And there is a provisional, provided a provisional sense of self that goes with all of that. You know, I'm married to, so now I'm a husband, teacher, tall male husband, teacher dude, right? But of course, all of that could change very easily, right? Any number of things could happen in order to change those situations where I'm no longer tall, I'm no longer male, I'm no longer married, and I'm not a teacher anymore. And so the socially constructed nature of the self, the provisional self, it kind of reveals that those aren't quite tangible enough. Those aren't quite real enough to hold up. They don't hold up in a court of Dharma, frankly, is the idea, right? And so just that alone, the idea of who do you think you are and upon what do you make that understanding? Is it, do you understand who you are relative to all these social conventions, right? But that's like, you know, that's an easy way to talk about no self or at least to interrogate the idea of self, right? The idea that I wanna to introduce tonight because it's going to be, I think, for me, the simplest to discuss uh, because of the magic, because of the rest of this poem and the, the kind of the, the theme of this poem. Another interesting way, and, and by the way, of course, there are even more ways to discuss no self, so many different ways to, to talk about this. So this is just one more. I've talked about it before, but this is, you know, just for tonight. The idea is, is this. So 
when the Buddha says in the opening uh, line, when he says that all dharmas, all phenomena are like illusions, what does he mean? What is he talking about? Well, that too has a number of different definitions, a number of different ways to understand it. But here's one way to understand that idea of all dharmas being like illusions. There is this interesting way in which we, we think. <laughs> There's a very interesting way in which we think. And it's almost sort of a default mode of thinking. It's, a, it's almost like we wouldn't even know how to think if we didn't do this. And what this is, is if I were to present with some this to you, it's very tempting to say that I have some thing in my hand, meaning that I have one thing in my hand. It's very tempting to do that. And that thing might be called a clock. And there you go. You see me, Michael, the teacher dude, right? With a clock in his hand, right? And if you're doing that, if you're, if you're seeing that, then something very interesting is going on regarding this clock which is that somehow you are taking what is a multiple. We got a clear plastic face, a button. I got a battery in here. Got these little things, got the hands. We even have a, a red hand, numbers. There's a lot going on here. But with the magic wand of a word called clock, we can actually conceive of there being only one thing in my hand. Again, all evidence is to the contrary. All the evidence is suggesting that there are many, many, many things in my hand, but the mind has this uncanny ability to what I call singularize. Just singularize it up into a nice, neat little package with one word. And, you know, by the way, if, the, if you're thinking like, well, that's just, that's language, Michael, that's semantics, you know? Yeah, it is language. But here's the thing about language. If I sold this to you, but I took out the battery and I took off the plastic face and I took off this button and I took off these buttons and I took all of this off and handed it to you, you'd say, wait a minute, I bought the clock. And I were to say, yeah, no, I gave you the clock. I gave you the, the this and that, that's the clock. All the, the rest of it is not necessary for the clock to function. So you got what you ordered in that way. You might be upset because you paid for the clock. And here we are in a real world situation of suffering, maybe anger, whatever it is, desire, desire for the clock that you paid good money for. All of the dukkha is going to be arising from this singularity of the clock, which has a very, very interesting existence, let's say. And what I mean by that is, is that the mind's ability to singularize that which is multiple is fascinating because it begs the question of where does that clock actually then exist? It's, it gets a little tricky in that regard, right? Now, by the way, let me just make something clear. This is kind of the Dharma lesson too. You might say, oh, I got you, Michael. The clock, that's, that's uh, 
gotcha. Like, okay, that's a singular. Okay. But what about the hands? Okay, let's just take one of the little hands of the clock and we could do this all over again. Meaning I could break it down molecularly for you and say, wait, which molecules, which molecules constitute the hand, you know? And actually like these hands, for example, happen to have the little glow in the dark strip. Do you need the glow in the dark strip in order for it to operate as a hand? So does the hand include the glow? In the and pretty soon you realize, oh, this habit of the mind to singularize something vis-a-vis -a, -vis a word, it's like happening everywhere all the time. In fact, I'll give you one of the greatest, one of the greatest singularizations is when we take that which is multiple with eyes and ears and nose and this and this and all of these different things, all of these different parts. And with the stroke of a name, Michael, we can box all of this up into a nice singularity. So what I'm getting at there is this ability to singularize something, slap a label on it, and then barter for it or buy it or worry about it. All of that's uh, samsaric and all, all of that's nice and all, but the Dharma here, sort of the, the, I would call it the Vipassana, the insight is to recognize the, to recognize what's going on there. In other words, the, this habit of mind to singularize. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm always trying to speak carefully, especially when we get into these settler Dharma conversations. But what I wanted to try to avoid was saying, you know, it's a, it's a habit of my mind to singularize. Because of course, right there, I did it again. Ah, oh, I singularized mind, my mind, right? So it's sort of, a little more careful to say mind has a habit of singularizing. And again, it's almost like it wouldn't even know how to think otherwise in that way. So that's tonight's um, example of for no self, which is this idea that just because you have a name or a name for this uh, amalgamation, let's call it an aggregation as the Buddha does, just because you have a name for this aggregation and you have a name for this aggregation too, meaning this hand. Oh, look, you did it again. You can singularize the hand into one hand, or you can singularize a finger into a finger, even though it has phalanges. Oh, a phalange. Oh, it's almost as if this never ends. Right. So <laughs> let's work within that because the idea here, if I could just sort of um, try to state it very bluntly, because it's, it's going to get there, but any game of singularization is a game of discrimination, which is discriminating my hand now from the rest of me even though somehow my hand is me and constitutes me, call it double think, but I can, I can hold the two simultaneously, right? But this idea is, is that anytime there's gonna be discriminating this from that, uh, tall from short, male from female, any of these kinds of discriminations, that's not gonna be seeing the Buddha. That's not seeing Tathagata. That's gonna be called delusion, illusion, confusion, ignorance. Buddhism's got all kinds of names for the normal conventional way of moving through reality and these singularities in that way. But if you wanna see the Buddha, if you wanna see the Tathagata, then it shouldn't be, now I'm quoting the Sutra, it shouldn't be by physical characteristics, by caste, by birth, by birthplace, or even by the Supreme Brahma voice. 
In fact, it goes on to say that it's not even by mind or consciousness that one can discern the Buddha. Okay, those are the themes for tonight. Any questions, comments, or answers, or ideas before we proceed with the poem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tanya. So not even by consciousness? Not the consciousness that you might think is between the ears and behind the eyes trapped in Tanya's brain, singular. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so now that we have a sense of, oh, and by the way, I just wanted to make this clear too. Um, this should be exciting for us in the 21st century. This should be exciting for us in the common era where we are truly, you know, being engaged with and involved with this beautiful Buddhist tradition, in particular, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition that is talking so clearly about the, um, well, in a way, I mean, to just put it bluntly again, the insignificance of caste, birth, birth family, birth place, and these things. There's a, you know, there's a way, of course, that that has always been a part of the Buddhist tradition, this kind of really deep egalitarianism, uh, call it anti-caste. But this is even taking that a little bit further in that way. Um, and so I, I just want to kind of celebrate that, the, the teaching in that way. Okay. So the language here gets a little tricky. But the Buddha goes on to say that the, the nature of all the Buddhas, of all Buddhas, Dharma body, the nature of all Buddha's dharmakaya transcends past, present, and future, transcends all time. With, by having a self nature free of all characteristics, unable to be placed into any category of dharma. Thereby, all Tathagatas are manifested their self nature without any arising or ceasing, without any of the five aggregates, with not the 12 entrances and not the 18 bases, abiding in fact without any basis at all. So let me clarify what's being spoken about there. If you're not familiar with it, I don't, uh, at least in Dharma doors, we don't get too into this idea, but we are, we are tonight. So the sutra mentions the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body, right? In fact, it says that the nature of all Buddha's Dharma body transcends past, present, and future. Yep. In fact, that Dharmakaya has a nature, has a svabhava, has a self nature that is free of all characteristics. And that Dharmakaya, that Dharma body, is unable to be placed in any category of Dharma. All right. So this is, you know, it's a kind of a very uh, Mahayana Buddhist idea, which is this, um, well, it's called, it's not really, I would say, explicit in this sutra. I would say it's implicit in this sutra. And it is a teaching that is called the three bodies of the Buddha. Um, again, this is a hallmark of Mahayana Buddhism, you do not see discourse about the three bodies of the Buddha in the uh, Hinayana and the small vehicle in the kind of earlier tradition. And if you're not familiar with it very quickly, 
you know, this really wild idea of the Buddha that we're talking about, where, where I say this thing about how the Buddha was not an Indian dude from 2,500 years ago, born of a kshatriya and all of that. Actually, what's being referenced there is this idea that the Buddha has these three bodies. One is the first, the basic, is called the Nirmanakaya, the transformation body. The second is called the Sambhogakaya, the bliss body. And the third is called the Dharma body, the Dharmakaya. The one that we're talking about tonight, the one that we're discussing in this poem is very much about the Dharma body, the Dharmakaya not a dude, not Indian, not Kshatriya, actually unidentifiable by any physical characteristic whatsoever. In fact, if you're using physical characteristics, you've missed it already. That's the Dharmakaya. This poem is definitely meant to elucidate the Dharmakaya. So I'll let the poem do that in a second. Really quickly though, what they then talk about in the Mahayana is Oh, that appearance of an Indian guy 2,500 years ago that appeared to be born, appeared to be of a Kshatriya clan, appeared to renounce, appeared to become enlightened, appeared to turn the Dharma wheel, and appeared to enter into Nirvana. That's the transformation body. That's this, uh, it, was a, it was a magical transformation of the Buddha all along to appear that way. In fact, that's called the transformation body um, because that's the body that the Buddha took on in order to transform humanity, they'll say. I have one more thing to say about the transformation body, but hold on, let's talk about the Sambhogakaya real quick. This is called the bliss body. In, in basic Mahayana tradition, what they will say is, is, you know, all those other Buddhas like Amitabha, Akshobhya, all of these kind of like with all these Buddha lands and all these like wild Buddhas everywhere. And, or if you go into a deep meditative trance and you have a vision of a Buddha, that's the Sambhogakaya, the bliss body. Then again, there's this Dharmakaya, which is completely, you know, you, it, it's, it, well, again, we're gonna get into it. So it's really, really hard to articulate in that way. I just want you to know that, that the teaching of the three bodies that I just walked you through really quickly is kind of a Mahayana way to talk about what happened historically, meaning that, Siddhartha situation. And then the Sambhogakaya to discuss all of these other Buddhas that we're talking about that have all these other qualities, right? And then there's this Dharmakaya. So that's sort of the traditional way to talk about this. But I want you to know that in the Mahayana tradition, they talk about how all of us possess these three bodies. The Nirmanakaya is well, you know, for me, Michael, it's the Michael version. It's the California born Dharma teacher dude. The Nirmanakaya, my transformation body, the body that, that this will use to attain enlightenment. This is my transformation body, and those are your transformation bodies in that sense. The bliss body is described as that that you that enters into the blissful realms of meditation that is not bound by the physical body of suffering, but is in a more ephemeral realm of blissful dhyanic meditation, that's your Sambhogakaya. You too have the Dharmakaya as well, but it is identifiable beyond the particular physical characteristics that you might inhabit in your Nirmanakaya. So you got the Dharmakaya too, but it's sort of, you know, everywhere in between all the discrimination and distinctions 
that you might have about yourself as an individual. If that sounded cryptic and crazy, it's meant to because it's we're talking about your Buddha nature. We're talking about that very profound idea of the kind of the Dharmakaya pervading everywhere in that way. So questions, answers, comments, ideas about the three bodies of the Buddha. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious about the word body and, and what's a useful way to think of it because one, one is very physical, like the, the historical Buddha and our body, but the other two aren't bodies per se, but what, but what are they or how do you think of them vis-a-vis -vis that word body? Yep, um, I've actually come, I've only come to this sort of realization recently. I've been doing a lot of teaching of the Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. And of course, the first foundation of mindfulness is kaya, is the body. The thing about that though, what I've come to realize because I've, I've gone digging deeper into the Satipatthana practice and I've gone digging deeper into the idea of the body. What's interesting about that is, let me just give you, let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that you were in the middle of a nightmare, but like all good dreams, you think it's reality. That's why you're scared because you think something is seriously at stake here. That's why it would be a nightmare in that way. Even in that scenario, one could do the Satipatthana and the proper order in to do that would be not to get too worked up about what one is seeing, but actually to take stock of the body, even though it's a dream body, it's still the body. Again, even though it would be a dream body, it is still the starting off point for doing mindfulness. And in other words, what I'm getting at is, is that when one enters into these, or I should say when one abides in a jhana or a samadhi, one is understood to have a body, but it's not the physical body. It is a, uh, in fact, if you read the Fruits of the Homeless Life, the uh, Samanapala Sutta, they describe creating a mind-made body in which one moves their vinyanic co consciousness out of the brain-bound consciousness structure and into the mind-made body. That's a different kaya. Maybe, the bis maybe that's the bliss body, maybe not, but actually it sort of neither is here nor there because the idea is we don't have just one body. It, it would be a, uh, a, an extreme sense of clinging to think that we do only have one body in that way. So, so that might uh, contextualize for you known the bliss body. The Dharmakaya is fascinating too for being a body. It's a kaya. However, uh, this is a pretty exalted uh, body. Uh, again, referring to the Vajra Pranipara Sutra, referring to the Dharma Sutra, or the, 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 the Diamond Sutra, it's a big body. But when the Sutra talks about a big body, they're talking about the Dharma Kaya. And the idea of the Dharma Kaya is that it is very, very associated with this idea of the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of the Dharma. But what happens when one's sense of self is, is, or the axis of the sense of self is obliterated in that way, and one truly is fully identified with the entire Dharma Dhatu. That's called the Dharmakaya, and it's what allows, if I were to go back to the very beginning of this poem, if one knows that all Dharmas are the same as illusions, this person will then be able to manifest hundreds of billions of Buddha bodies and abide in myriad lands, liberating all sentient beings or delivering all sentient beings. So great question, Noam. <laughs> okay. 
Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Cool. So we're gonna, again, as promised, we're about to go deeper into this idea of this Dharma body. So, um, um, I read this part, so let me make it clear. So it says that this Dharmakaya, right, transcends past, present, and future. It transcends all time. It says that it has a nature free of all lakshana, free of all characteristics, that it's unable to be placed in any category of dharma. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? You can't categorize it beyond beyond. It says it is thereby by way of this dharmakaya that all tathagatas, all buddhas are manifested and that they are manifested, it says, without aggregation, entrance, or base. That would be the, actually the, the, the direct way of translating it, direct uh, translation of the Chinese. But what they mean to say, of course, is that it's without the five aggregates, without the 12 entrances, and without the 18 bases. And if you're not familiar with those, they are talking about the five skandhas, the five aggregates, this body of form, bodily sensations, conditioning, consciousness. <laughs> um, let's see, that was four. Form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Those are the five aggregates, which of course in classical Buddhism are, you know, I said that thing about Michael is a convenient label for a perceived singularity that isn't there. If I'm hip to that, if I'm wise to the illusory nature of all singularities, then I understand the five aggregates. This is suggesting that the Dharmakaya is, of course, even beyond the five aggregates. It's beyond the 12 entrances, which if you're not familiar with that language in Buddhism, the 12 entrances or the 12 gates are the six sensory organs and the six sensory objects. And then if you're not familiar with the 18 abodes or the 18 bases, these are the six senses, the six sensory objects and the six vinyana that emerge based upon their relationship. So the world of seeing, the world of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking, those are the 18 dot twos. This is of course suggesting that this dharmakaya is without the five aggregates, without the 12 entrances, without the 18 realms or the 18 sense bases. In fact, it abides without being based on anything at all. It goes on to say, like this, because of this, the Buddha's Dharmakaya, the, the Dharma body of the Buddha, cannot be seen by any of the five eyes. <clears throat> The five eyes are also a theme of the Vajrapranyaparamita Sutra. Again, this sutra we're reading tonight is just an elaboration on that important diamond sutra. The five eyes are the physical eye, the divine eye. The divine eye is considered sort of the third eye, which could see maybe uh, other dimensions, maybe even see through solid objects a little bit. The third eye is called the wisdom eye. The wisdom eye in Buddhism is actually particularly the eye that sees in terms of emptiness, sees all things in terms of their empty nature. That's the wisdom eye. The fourth of the five eyes is called the Dharma eye. That's the eye of 
knowledge that sees the Dharma Dhatu, that sees all things as this interdependent realm of dharmas and the, the, the sense about the Dharma eye is that it views all things equanimously or inequality. It views all dharmas equally. So not the emptiness of the wisdom eye, but the kind of upeksha of equanimity. And then the fifth eye is the Buddha eye, the all-knowing, all-omniscient eye. And this actually says that, the, that this dharmakaya that is not based on the aggregates, the entrances, the bases, in fact, that it doesn't abide anywhere on anything, it cannot be seen by the five eyes. The Buddha goes on to say, if someone says, I see the Buddha, this is actually the inability of seeing. <laughs> that's what it says. If someone says, I see the Buddha, then, then that's actually them saying, I don't know how, I can't see. <laughs> it's funny. So if someone says, I see the Buddha, this is actually the inability to see. By seeing without seeing, like the tracks of a bird in the sky, like something you've never seen before, that's how you see the Buddha. Equanimous, like akasha, like space, a single undifferentiated characteristic. So that's a very, uh, a classic Buddhist, um, um, a, a classic Buddhist line they use a lot, which is about the tracks of a bird in the sky. So it's, it's a lovely expression, right? It's like, you know, a little critter walks on the ground, it leaves uh, footprints, right? Little tracks. Do birds leave tracks in the sky? They don't, right? It's sort of part of the nature of space in that way. And so the Buddhists like to use that idea of like tracks of a bird, right, in the sky. And so this idea, and this is where this sutra starts to get a, almost like Zen. It gets a little ko koanic, right, with this idea of by seeing without seeing. And, and then this beautiful line, and, it, and I got to tell you, all the, the two other English translations are very different. Um, and this is a very hard line of Chinese to translate, but it's very beautiful. It says that you should see the Buddha like something you've never seen before, but it's hard actually to put this into, it's, um, it's almost like, um, a problem of tense, they want to just like, like a, 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 a kind of a funny joke that I often use uh, is I have, I have something right over there. Do you want it? Do you desire it or are you fearful of it? And the idea is, is that, well, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't heard it. I haven't smelt it. I haven't tasted it. I haven't touched it yet. So I can't, I can't develop a reaction, a vedana. I don't know whether I want it or I don't want it. And so that, that over there, that which you haven't seen yet, that's how you should see the Buddha. And it's a, it's almost, you know, it's a very beautiful contemplation, that idea of Wow, what does that look like? That which I have never seen. What does that sound like? That which I haven't heard yet, right? So it's a- Michael, that's when, when they talk, uh, I think it's in Sen, right? When they talk about uh, Shoshin mind. This is what you're referring to, beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. That is very much exactly what the, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, the Zen tradition is tricky. Um, but that's exactly the idea of the Zen mind, beginner's mind is this idea of, I mean, in many ways, this is even 
a little crazier than that because the Zen mind, beginner's mind is sort of about, as far as I understand it, it's like approaching everything anew in that way, which is beautiful. That's like a very amazing, beautiful teaching to approach everything anew in that sense without prejudice and not just, again, the, the, the gross, foolish prejudice, but just the subtle, the most subtle form of pre prejudgment. It's a beautiful mind, a be truly a beginner's mind to approach everything without any prejudgment or prejudice. But this is kind of an even subtler Dharma point about the Dharmakaya, which is that when it says, see it without seeing, it's because of this idea that it's to be seen with some other eye, not the physical eye, not, again, not even the divine eye, wisdom eye, Dharma eye, or Buddha eye. So, but it's definitely Connie in that exact frame of mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's read a little more here. This kind of actually begins a new sort of uh, division of the poem. Um, and actually, I mean, it, it begins a new section of the poem, but you really can't uh, I think I appreciate it. Let me go back to the previous line. In describing the Buddha as, as like something you've never seen before, it says, view the Buddha at equanimous like space. I've talked about space in the past and I'm, I can't go down that road tonight. So refer to other Dharma talks about space. Equanimous like space. And then it says this crazy thing, which is with a single lakshana or actually with a single undifferentiated characteristic, a single undifferentiated lakshana. And that, you know, that's kind of a really heavy wild idea there of this one undifferentiated characteristic. It, it's kind of a heavy idea, but the reason why I mention it as a concept, one single undifferentiated characteristic is because the next line is a, is a wild, long string of ideas that I believe are meant to be read as like one single undifferentiated characteristic. But it reads, Shila Samadhi Pranya Vimoksha, and the vimoksha of knowledge and vision. So the moral discipline, samadhi meditation, pranya wisdom, and vimoksha liberation, and the liberation, the vimoksha of knowledge and vision. All of this, all of this tathagata punya, all of this merit of the tathagata is without differentiation all abiding in the nature of emptiness without attachment to any dharma, anything. All illusory, all without inherent nature, all without arising. Okay. So, we've kind of reached this uh, kind of amazing point in the poem where even the Dharma, even the teachings of the Buddha about moral discipline, about meditation, about wisdom, about nirvana or vimoksha, liberation, even those ideas are getting undifferentiated. And this kind of, you know, not kind of, it truly makes very good, clear Dharma sense to begin to not differentiate even those subtle Dharmas in that way. Because this whole teaching or the vibe, the vibe of the teaching tonight is about not differentiating this from that, not differentiating anything in that way. And if you go back to my opening remarks, not 
trying to singularize, say, moral discipline from wisdom, as if those were two different things. So everything's coming together now in that way, to the point where you just get this long string of ideas, shila, samadhi, pranya, vimoksha, and the vimoksha of, of knowledge and vision. All of that punya, all of that merit of the Buddha, of the Tathagata, is actually without differentiation, all abiding in the nature of emptiness without any attachment to anything. They are all illusory, all without inherent nature and without any coming into being. Everybody okay with that? <laughs> you know, a lot of this is really meant to be deeply thought about, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like I didn't say it right in that way. It's just heavy ideas in that way. But now, finally, the Buddha is now about to directly address one of Bhadra's questions. So if, if you remember from my opening remarks, one of the things Bhadra was saying was, wow, there's all these Buddhas everywhere. Which one's the real you? Because I want to make offerings to the real Tathagata, not to a phantasm, not to an illusion, but to the real one, right? And so, of course, we've been told now all Buddhas are illusory, all of that, right, in that sense. But the Buddha then goes on to say, to make offerings to one Tathagata is to make offerings to many Buddhas. For the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Buddhas is equanimous without differentiation. Like this or in this way, each Buddha is able to give rise to much punya, to much merit, universally giving to all Tathagatas which certainly produces great merit or great fruit. Due to this pure, equanimous, self-realized nature of the Dharma, for that reason, all Tathagatas are one without differentiation. You asked, which is the true Buddha? You must abandon this distracted mind and listen well to what I have to say. You should abide in the wisdom of right mindfulness, observing and investigating all dharmas. Each is without any arising, yet are erroneously seen as real. If a physical appearance arises, then it should also cease. Therefore, all the Tathagatas are without arising in any way, nor have they already arisen, nor will they ever have complete cessation. This is the only way to observe the Tathagata, by seeing without seeing, or alternate translation, by seeing the unseen, or something to that effect. Thus, you can see the Buddha not abiding anywhere. Only fools rely upon the five aggregates, but you should observe that the aggregates, you should observe the aggregates just like you do the Buddhas. All Buddhas and all dharmas and even all sentient beings are characterized by not having characteristics without abiding anywhere. If you make this investigative observation, you will quickly realize bodhi, awakening. All dharmas, all phenomena, all things are without being, arising only from erroneous discrimination. Causes and conditions are also empty by nature, for they are free of any fixed nature. Like this, 
one is fully able to know the emptiness of all causes and conditions. Then you will fully know the free, pure Dharma. And by that, and by that clarified Dharma eye, you will be able to see the Tathagata. Okay, that's actually the end of the poem. I just wanted to make sure I read the whole thing tonight. Now we're going to go back. Anything pop out? Questions, comments, answers, ideas? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Michael, I have a question. So obviously this, this text talks a lot about emptiness as a shunyata and dependent origination and then illusion. And I just read earlier today that um, especially in um, Vajrayana, sorry, I have my washing machine on. <laughs> um, so you might hear some background noise. Nope, um, no problem. Okay, okay, cool. Um, that in Vajrayana, they, it's, and I just want to double check with you. It, it is said that you know, for example, emotions are not necessarily illusions or phenomena are not necessarily illusions, um, but more phenomena in general is the expression of enlightenment, is enlightenment um, and awakening. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts around, you know, the reality that we perceive yeah mm -hmm. you know um, some thoughts around that yeah i mean that <clears throat> that idea it really lines up uh very squarely with it's a it's a um, it's a thing that comes up a lot in these sutras and i'm I'm not going to go digging around for an a, a exact example of it. I'm just going to kind of riff off one off the top of my head. But the idea is the, the, the saying that you will be, that you'll see a lot, for example, is something to the effect of that the, the Buddha, the Tathagata cannot be seen by having physical characteristics but is not apart from physical characteristics. Like that's kind of a, a formula that you'll see often in Mahayana sutras, that this idea that you can't, you can't discern or discriminate a Buddha based on his color of skin, gender, uh, nationality, and things like that. And so the temptation then is to move kind of entirely away from characteristics in that way. But what the sutras will say, though, is that but the Buddha cannot be seen apart from characteristics. And, and that slight kind of paradox is kind of along the lines of what you're talking about, Connie, which is it's kind of about um, well, on the one hand, just to make that clear, what I just said, it, it's tempting to be like, oh, all of this that I'm seeing here, you know, these different people with their different characteristics. Oh, this is just delusion. Oh, this is just delusion. Oh, this is just suffering. Bye. And the idea is like, I'm going to go over here and look for the Buddha. I'll be over here looking for the Buddha. And the idea here is, is that the, the Buddhists no more over there than over there. In fact, one can sort of understand, come to an understanding in that way, even see in the sense of the sutra, one can see the Buddha right here if one sort of has the eyes to see in that way. And so, so Connie, kind of what you're getting at is the Vajrayana goes goes kind of full on with that idea of enlightenment, the Buddha, the true nature of the Buddha being the aggregates, being the kleshas, being these things. And, that, you know, Vajrayana is tricky. It's easily misconstrued in a certain sense. 
And again, the idea here, the, the, the teaching as, as, I, as this sutra presents it, is this idea that if I'm discriminating different people, and certainly if I'm boxing people into categories and then hierarchy, hierarchifying people and all of that, yeah, that's delusion, that's, that's suffering. But there's also this way to not do that. And, you know, the best example I can give, the best example I can try to give in the time that remains has to do with this, the refrain that we find often, which is this refrain of the real body of the Buddha being equanimous like space, right? So, if you're familiar with Mahayana Sutras, if you're coming to Dharma Doors, we talk about space a lot. We talk about Akasha. And I think I went into a, a space thing last week. But, you know, the idea here is, is that space is this very interesting dimension of reality. And it's a very interesting develop, uh, dimension of reality, you know, because space is just this aspect to form, there's a way in which if I'm going to make those singularizations, right? If, I, if there's a way in which if, if I'm gonna understand something, let's say my hand, then there needs to be this space that sort of isolates the hand. And, and this is where I went last week into describing how space is not a thing at all. It's, it's, it's certainly not physical. It's not out there. It, if you wanna kind of start to really get or understand space, you have to kind of really start to think of it as a, as a dimension of consciousness, not as a dimension of the physical world. It's sort of a, a, a dimension of thinking about things that, that the mind, again, just mind requires space so that it can figure out form and understand form in that way. So if you refer to last week or if you just understood what I just said, you kind of see how forms everywhere but nowhere. It's infinite, but completely immeasurable, undetectable. And when they keep talking about how the real body of the Buddha is like space, they do mean that it's like that. So they're not saying the Buddha and Buddha body and enlightenment and all of that is the same as space, but they're saying, if, if you wanna kind of conceptually touch the Buddha, think about space. Think about the way space functions vis-a-vis -vis form, right? And again, last week I went into a kind of a longer discussion about how we need, the mind needs space to conceive of anything in that way. And it's always like uh, coterminous with form in that way. It's always right there with it, but it's invisible indetectable, inconceivable in a sense. So if you understand that, that space, the real body of the Buddha in that way, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that space thing, but it's not space. It's even uh, more profound than that in a way. Because space, like I just defined it, it's only functioning in, within the realm of form. It, it's, a, it's an aspect of the realm of form. Form is about discrimination. And so there's a way in which space is sort of, you know, it's what's helping us discriminate in that way. But if you understand that kind of relationship, then the the body of the Buddha that we're talking about tonight, that's like space, 
Well, that's where it's more about wisdom. And the idea is, is that there's a way in which, and, and uh, this is very much going back to Connie's question about the Vajrayana, but there's a really interesting way in which then any, even an act of discrimination is a strange, you know, instance of knowledge, an instance of knowing. And there's a way in which Buddha is about knowledge and knowing, and it's not certainly not interested in us being deluded and suffering in that way. But exactly the same way that space and form have a relationship, the Dharma body, the Dharma Kaya and wisdom have a relationship. And I, uh, there's probably not much more I should say about it than that. Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Even if it's about that, I'll say more, but I just kind of. All right. So just then I want to finish up because it kind of was, again, it was Bhadra's primary question. He's like, I really want to make offerings to the Buddha tell me which one's the real one so I can make offerings to him. And the Buddha, of course, responds by saying to make offerings to one Tathagata is to make offerings to many Tathagatas or many Buddhas in that way. For the Dharmakaya of all Buddhas is equanimous without differentiation. Right. So this has been the theme of the night this dharmakaya being without differentiation. One of the things to think about as it pertains to that idea, I, a, a way that you can think about this, I've, I, I have found this to be helpful in the past for myself. So I give it to you as an opaya in that sense. So they talk about Siddhartha, you know, the Indian guy I talked about, who became enlightened 2,500 years ago. And he claims he wasn't even the first Buddha in that way. He says, there was a bunch of Buddhas before me and there's be Buddhas after me, right? And the way that I was taught this and the way that I've come to understand it is there was Siddhartha, meaning like an Indian dude. And there were other Buddhas that were dudes or women at, or at some point. But as they progressed through the Bodhisattva path and sort of shed that delusion, shed discrimination, shed duality in that way, they approach and eventually sit under the tree of enlightenment and become enlightened. And what the teaching is regarding the Dharmakaya is that actually when Siddhartha became enlightened, he, and I, I'm using language very coarsely now, but the idea is, is that Siddhartha at that point upon becoming a Buddha didn't, didn't have an experience that was like the other Buddhas, he actually had that, ex that experience because the point is that experience is undifferentiated. There is only kind of one Buddha experience in that way. And that idea of when you reach enlightenment, when we all reach enlightenment, it'll be that experience. It won't be something like it it will actually be the same experience. And, you know, there's just a certain kind of dharmic consistency to that. That if we were really talking about two different experiences, then that would be dualistic in a deep way and not make any sense. And so we understand that there is just sort of this one uh, that for the for the Dharmakaya of all Buddhas is equanimous without differentiation. So where this goes, 
is this idea that to make offerings to one Tathagata is to make offerings to all Tathagatas because of this undifferentiated nature of the Dharmakaya. What they're kind of getting at here, by the way, and I know it, it, it's kind of getting late, so I just want to start to wrap this up. In the old version of Buddhism, of course, there was this idea of, um, well, like karmic reciprocity, this idea of punya that's being mentioned, this idea of merit. And in early Buddhism, there was this idea that there were kind of different levels of spiritual cultivation that went all the way up to an arhat. And within the realm of karmic reciprocity, if I gave some food to a, a, a monk or let's say even a nun who was just ordained that day, I might get like, you know, one merit point. But if I give the same food to an arhat, I'm going to get like a hundred merit points. If I give food to the Buddha, it's a lot of merit. It's like way more than an arhat, way more than a newly ordained person, right? That's early Buddhism. And there's a reason why Mahayana Buddhism sort of transcends the transactional nature of giving, the transactional nature of dana, the transactional nature of karma in that way. And so actually what this is sort of talking about, if I could just say it very simply, is giving that food to, I mean, not even a newly ordained Buddhist monk or nun, but giving it to a homeless person on the street as an offering to the Tathagata, as an offering to their most enlightened Buddha nature. And what this is saying is, is that to do that is to give an offering to the Tathagata. In fact, to do that is to give an offering to all the Tathagatas. And what I want you to see is, is that what they're describing is the, the heart and mind, the heart mind of someone who actually gives, say to a homeless person, but with this idea that, wow, the, the most enlightened world honored one sleeping on the street tonight versus that kind of pity, oh, this poor, sad person. Wouldn't it be good of me to give them something, right? Oh, versus this deep humility of, of recognizing that person in the street as the world honored one in that way. That is a, a kind of my interpretation slash summary of the point of this, the last part of this poem. Uh, I think it's a powerful message. I think it's a very important message to say the least. Um, yeah, and so what better point to leave it at than that, I think. Um, voila. Yay. Thanks, Michael. Oh, my pleasure. So happy we could do it. Um, there's still more to the sutra to go. Not too much more, though. Probably just a couple more nights. Um, but I hope you can uh, come back next Sunday for part six. <laughs>